Can everybody hear me? Can everybody hear me up there? Okay. So last time we talked about uh, convex hulls. Uh, the convex hull of a point set is the smallest convex polygon, or more generally in higher dimensions, polytope, that contains all the points. And uh, it's generally the shape of the point set. Right? So the interior points are eliminated, only has the exterior convex hull points. And it generalizes to arbitrary dimensions, lots of applications, including gaming and simulations. And it's a very ubiquitous problem. So we came up with an algorithm, uh, Jarvis's March, uh, named after the guy who invented it back in the early 70s. His name was Jarvis. Uh, you basically rotate a line and you keep tracking this supporting line around the periphery of the point set, um, de detecting a new convex hull point at every step. Of course, you don't literally do it continuously as an algorithm. Uh, you do it discreetly, but you find the uh, point with the best, smallest angle compared to the point that you're at now. And once you keep doing this, <coughs> you find a convex hull. And this is called sometimes the gift wrapping method. Uh, its running time is proportional to the number of points times the size of the convex hull that you find. So it's um, not just input dependent, it's output dependent. So it's great if you only have a few points in a convex hull. And it's the analog of selection sort, basically. And it generalizes to, to higher dimensions. Um, here we see a graphical depiction of how this gift wrapping method, the Jarvis Marsh, works in 3D. Uh, basically, instead of a, a line that rotates, you have a plane that rotates until it hits two points. Then you rotate it around that axis until it hits a third point, And now you have a face of this 3D polytope that's the convex hull. And you keep doing that, discovering more and more faces of the convex hull. And when you're done, you've no more new faces to be discovered. Uh, any questions about any of that? So it's almost done there in 3D. and the convex hull forms and all the interior points are excluded from the convex hull. Questions, comments? Yeah. Yeah, so you first touch it on some point, and then you rotate it until it hits a second point. And then you rotate it around these two points, because it's a plane now. And when you rotate around these two points, it will finally hit a third point. So just like in 2D, a pair of points determines a line. In 3D, a triplets of points determine a plane. So you have to find this third point. Once you find this third point, you go off its edges, and you keep repeating for each of its edges. You rotate a plane planted there until it hits yet one more point, and you do it for the other edge, and so on, and you keep going until you exhaust all the, ver all the uh, edges, and there's no more new edges to be found. That's, that's when you know you found the entire convex hull. Uh, other questions? And it works in, in, in four dimensions, five dimensions, except planes, there'll be hyperplanes and you know, higher dimensional faces and so on. But the generalization is pretty straightforward. Algorithmically, it's, it's the same. And then uh, we um, uh, started talking about gram scan. I think that's where we stopped last time, right? So gram scan. Uh, also finds a convex hull, but in a very different way. And again, this is from the same era, early 70s. Uh, Ron Graham, by the way, was the head of AT&T mathematical research for many years. Uh, he's now at UCSD, retired, I think, but great mathematician and algorithms designer. So you start with the point of the least x, and you sort all the other points by polar angle with respect to that point. So this line here, that's the least x-coordinate point, vertical line, starts rotating. And as it rotates, it picks up the points in polar angle order, least to largest. Right? So it's a kind of a linear scan. How does it know which points to pick? Well, it computes the polar angles of all the points and then sorts those polar angles using any n log n algorithm, like merge sort or, or heap sort or whatever. Um, and as you scan around, you're forming this simple polygon, not necessarily convex. It's not a convex hole. It just connects all the dots, but it connects them in polar angle order. Okay. And by the way, um, how do you compute these angles? 
you know, algorithmically in your program, you know, what, what kind of technique or approach would you use to compute these angles of all the points with respect to this anchor point? Any, any thoughts? Yeah, so you basically use trig, right? You use trigonometry, sines, cosines, you know, you, you do the right things to, to get those angles, right? So from, from, from a pair of segments, you can compute the angle between them if you, you know, take some sines and cosines. And never mind exactly you know, all the details of that, but it's, it's straightforward. How many have some idea what I'm talking about? Yeah, you just use trig, basically. That's why we have you take trig and algebra before you get into computer science. So we don't have to dive into all these gory details every time we mention them. Anyway, at the end, you'll have this closed, simple curve by virtue of it being sp sorted by polar angle around some origin, which is arbitrarily chosen as the least x point. And then comes the next phase, which is you start going around the periphery of this closed, simple curve, which is not convex necessarily. But what you do is you turn it into an enclosing convex polygon by doing the following. You start again with the origin, which is the least x coordinate point on the far left. And then you sk keep scanning, and you get this next guy. And this could be a convex hole point. We don't know. We assume it is. And this could be convex hole point. We don't know. We assume it is. But we go to the next guy. And every time you go to the next point, you compute the interior angle that you're forming. Because you're, you're sort of trying to wrap. It's almost like gift wrapping at this point. You're trying to wrap this point set. But this angle here will not be convex. It will be reflex. It will be greater than 180. And if that interior angle there is greater than 180, what do you know about this point there, right at the angle? Is it in the convex hole or not in the convex hole? Not. It's, it can't be because it's, it's going the wrong way. Right? The angle is bigger than 180. So what you do is you skip this point, and instead you connect straight there. You don't pass go. You don't collect $200. You go straight to your destination. And this angle now, the green one, is convex angle, less than 180. Uh, so then you pick the next one, and the angle there is OK. This angle is OK, so you keep going. And the convex hole could be all of these red lines. But now you pick the next one, and this interior angle here is bigger than 180. So you know that point cannot be part of the convex hole. So what you do is you bypass this point and go straight there. But notice what happened when you do that. This angle here became reflex, became bigger than 180. So you just keep regurgitating this heuristic, this rule. And since this is bigger than 180, you've got to bypass this one again. So these two red lines become blue, and then this red line goes next to the next guy. And these, both of these points were eliminated from being inside the convex hole, for sure. Okay, And then you just keep going. You pick the next one after that, and the next one after that, and the next one after that. Oops, Le bigger than 180. So you eliminate this point, and you go straight there. Okay, And these are now not part of the convex hole. But then when you go to the next one, you see this became bigger than 180. So you eliminate that one, too, and you go straight there. And same thing happens here. So these angles that keep growing past one, it can cascade back arbitrarily far. How many can see that? It could be a cascade of them going backwards not just the current one, and you keep going. And you, but that's OK. That's what you do. So you eliminate this, and then these two are no longer being considered as part of a convex hole. And then you go straight there, straight there, and then straight there. That's OK. Oops, 180 again, bigger than 180. So you eliminate this guy. You go straight here. And then that's bigger than 180. So it gets, get, gets eliminated. You go straight here instead. And then that's bigger than 180. You eliminate that. You go straight here. And so you're forming the convex hole in the red lines. And then you go here, and then here, bigger than 180, so you go straight there. And then when you go here, bigger than 180 right there, so you go straight here instead. And then you end up where you started, and that's when you stop. 
So you eliminated all these interior points using this method. How long does this scan take? Once you have the non-convex polygon, this simple pol polygon through the points, how long does it take to scan it this way, what we just did, in terms of the number of points and the number of points? How many say n squared? How many say better than n squared? How much better? How many say n log n? So, so what's, what, what is it better than n squared in this case here? You're right, it is better than n squared. It's not completely obvious. How many see linear time for the scan? Okay, just, just a few people. All right. So I want to make sure that most of the class sees this. Until, until then, we cannot go forward. Um, intuitively, you're right to suspect that it could be n squared. Why? Because you're going to go through every point, right? So that's n points right there you're going to go through. That's unavoidable, so at least linear. You can't not look at one point because that point could be very far away and that could be part of the convex hole. If you skipped it, you'll never know and you won't include it in the far convex hole. So that's a proof that it's got to be at least, and every point's got to be inspected at least once. And this cascading, going back and going back, right, the, the cascades can go arbitrarily far backwards. How many can see that? So they can go end up to end backwards potentially. You could have picked a thousand points thinking they're part of the convex hole, but the thousand and first point, because it, it could have could have eliminated all these previous thousand points, one at a time going backwards. How many can see that can happen? Yeah, I mean, we already saw three, four, five points can cascade backwards. Arbitrary number can cascade backwards. So you go through n points, and you can skate backwards up to n points per point. So that's n times n, and there's your n squared. But that's pessimistic. Argue to me that it's linear overall. Yeah. Twice, the, the force is strong in this one. So you, every point gets hit once on the way forward, and potentially once on the way backwards gets eliminated through some cascade. But once it does, it's never looked at again. How many can see that? Yeah. So each point can be looked at twice, once on the way forward and once on the way backwards to an elimination of a cascade. But that's it. So it's linear overall. The cascades can, yeah, each, a single cascade could go a lot backwards. But then future cascades cannot cover that same ground as that past cascade. You're done with that. Everything that was in the way of the past cascade going backwards will never be examined or gone over again. And that's the more insightful way to look at this process. So when you said n squared, you weren't wrong. It is big O of n squared. But it's also big O of n. And the two statements do not contradict each other. We never said it's, it's omega of n squared. We never said it's theta of n squared. We said it's big O of n squared. Yeah. Just like you can say, you know, you can buy a house for a billion dollars. A billion dollars is sufficient to buy a home. Uh, not a false statement, but a very pessimistic gross overestimation of the true cost. So th yeah, this is n squared, but it's also n. And we know it can be better than n. So the scan part is optimal in terms of the number of points and how many get it now it's linear okay any questions about that so we just saw a form of what's called amortized analysis amortized analysis looks at an entire sequence of operations and calculates the cost for the entire sequence not the cost for a single operation and once you calculate the cost for the entire sequence, it could be a lot less than the cost, maximum cost of a single operation multiplied by the number of operations n. And in real life, there's all sorts of examples like that too. Right? If you buy one plastic straw shipped from Amazon, uh, it'll cost you probably $3.99. One, one plastic straw. 
uh, because it'll be you know one penny for the straw and then three ninety nine for the shipping, or three ninety eight I guess for the shipping. But that doesn't mean if you buy a thousand straws, it'll be three hundred ninety nine dollars because the shipping cost gets distributed over the entire pack of straws. They don't weigh very much; they weigh just a few grams, right? So one straw will cost a penny. A, a thousand of them will cost, you know. Ten dollars or whatever times a penny, a thousand times a penny is ten dollars, plus the shipping, which is three ninety nine. So the price, the amortized price per straw, is a lot less than what it was before if you buy them in bulk. Uh, it's like it's like retail versus wholesale, right? Prices. If you buy in bulk, you're saving the producer a lot of shipping and packing and handling and manpower and you know deliveries and uh, and and you get you get the discount. So here we get a discount for doing a lot of these, not just one cascade backwards, but all the sum of the all, all the cascades add up to not very much because you're doing a bunch of them and you're getting the wholesale bulk discount here. And in algorithm design, that happens a lot. It's called amortized analysis. And we'll get to more examples of that later in the course. It's, it's, it's a whole topic unto itself. OK. Uh, how did we even get the blue polygon? from the point set, well, we sorted. We sorted the points, because the original point set was just points. There was no polygon involved. But we imposed a simple closed polygon on it. Simple means not self-intersecting. It does, simple doesn't mean trivial. It means non-self-intersecting. It's a mathematical term. Uh, so to get that polygon, we sorted. And once we sorted, we pulled off this so-called gram scan. And so the time to sort was really a bottleneck here in this algorithm overall for the convex hull. Once you sorted, the rest was linear time for the scan. So the scan was the easy part, algorithmically speaking. Okay. So that was only linear time to scan, but n log n time to sort. And the worst case of this algorithm is also n log n time, because it's bottleneck by the sorting, and the sorting works in worst case n log n if you choose the right sort. And by right sort, we mean merge sort, heap sort, any sort that works in n log n worst case here. Just be careful not to choose a quadratic time sort like bubble sort or insertion sort, because then you'll blow up to quadratic time overall unnecessarily. You don't want to do that. Uh, and a drawback here is that this algorithm d doesn't generalize to higher dimensions. Because how do you sort points in polar angle by you know, if you're in 3D or 5D, not so, not so easy, not so clear even how, how this kind of sorting is even defined. Dimensions. It doesn't parallelize either, because this scanning is a linear kind of operation. So if you have multiple cores, it's not going to help you here, and, uh, at least not in an obvious way. So that's Graham scan. And it does intrinsically rely on sorting. Soon we'll see that sorting is sort of an essential part of convex hull construction. So that's not obvious at all now, at this point. We saw that sorting is sufficient to give you convex hull with a simple scan step after the sorting. But we don't know that it's essential. You'll see that you can't get away from n log n. Convex hull is as bad as sorting, actually. All right, so let's compare these two convex hull algorithms that we saw. The, um, uh, Jarvis is March, which is the gift wrapping method that works in time n times h. And h is the size of the convex hull, number of points in the convex hull that you end up with. Um, and separately, we saw that n log n gram scan, uh, n log n times is sufficient to create the convex hull in the separate gram scan algorithm. And there's two algorithms, and they're incomparable. Because I can ask you, uh, which is better? Do you want to use this one, or do you want to use this one? Which is better than the other in terms of speed? Big O asymptotic speed. Which one is better? Yeah. It depends on the point set. Sometimes this will be better, sometimes that will be better. When will one be better? If h, if the size of the convex hull is less than the log of the number of points, then obviously this one will win. If it's a constant number or log log or you know, the square root of the log or something smaller than log, 
that'll that'll be that'll be a better algorithm to use. Uh, on the other hand, if the uh, size of a convex hull is almost all the points, if they all say like periphery of a, of a circle, all of them will be in the convex hull. And then n times h will be quadratic because h is linear, and, and the time for running Jarvis's march is n times h. n times linear is quadratic if h is as large as n. So in that case, n log n is better, and you use graph scan. But how how would you know which one to use? I'll give you some um, arbitrary point set, and say find me the convex hull, and you have both of these subroutines in your library already programmed and they're both correct. Which one are you going to use? Ah, now you're getting it. You can use both of them, run both of them in parallel on two different threads. And whichever one finishes first, abort the other. And then you're guaranteed not to be worse than n log n and often as good as n times h. And what, I, what are you paying for this? What penalty are you paying for this privilege? Spa a little bit of space, yeah? Not asymptotically, just maybe double the space, and what else? What are you paying in time? Yeah, you roughly double, because you're running both. So you go back and forth, back and forth, simultaneously running both. So you're paying double in time, and maybe double in space, even though you may be able to do it in place if you're you know, clever enough. Um, but the benefit you get is you don't need to know a priori which category your input falls into and worry about falling into quadratic time, which will be terrible. So you can uh, parallelize it. That's, a, again, meta-heuristic. And in real life, again, when, when, when you interview for jobs, you know, you're using this kind of meta -heuristic. You interview for several jobs, not just one, and then make a decision. Right. So that works. Uh, notice that you don't even have to parallelize it. You can do it in the serial. How would you do it in serial? So there, there's the big hint right here. So just so you don't think you must run it in pa two parallel threads in a parallel fashion, you can do it in serial. What you can do is you can run Jarvis's march first, for how long? Because you don't want to run it to the end, because you might end up quadratic time. That's terrible. Run it for n log n time on the clock. So, so you know what n is coming in the door. That's how many points you have. So compute n log n. Run Jarvis's march for n log n time. And if it finishes, what do you do within n log n time? Or less. It can finish much quicker than n log n. If h is constant, it'll finish within linear time. But if it finishes within n log n time, you just report the answer. If you don't see it finishing within n log n time, what do you do then? Not a mystery at this point. Abort, ignore it, run the other one to completion. How many understand that Jedi trick? Okay. Any questions about that? So when I say meta heuristic, run them in parallel. You know, don't take it too literally. There's lots of ways to slice that idea into implementation, right? Yeah. So that's like a real life example of when you talked about n log n, or like ignoring constants. So what if it was like three n log n? Excellent point. So you're saying, how do you know the constant? Yeah, you compute n log n, but not just one times n log n. Maybe it's two times n log n, three times n log n. So what would you do in, in practice if you actually wanted to implement this serial meta heuristic? You can, you can profile things ahead of time. And every algorithm has some intrinsic constant that you can estimate by running it in a lot of random point sets. So let's say the constant is 2.7. So let it run for 5n time. Or, or, or you know, uh, make the constant 5. So 5n log n, just to be generous. So make it a little bit more than what you think the constant ought to be based on previous experiences and simulations and so on. Every algorithm that runs in a certain time 
uh, you can guesstimate the, uh, an average what the constant is, or at least a range for the constant. You know between, say, 2 and 3. So, so let it run for 4 times n log n time, just to give it uh, more, more slack. And if it still doesn't finish within that time, then abort and use the other one. Can you give me examples from real life when you actually do this? A meta heuristic in a serial fashion, when if one doesn't pan out, you abort and uh, let another one have a chance at it. Does that ring a bell as a general strategy from real life? Yeah. So there's two lines at the market. You're standing in one line that you think will be faster. But over t after 10, 20 minutes, you see that it's not fast, and you switch to the other line. You give up. A more, more dramatic and probably more relevant example from real life for you is uh, marriage. <laughs> Just saying, you know. This, this may have happened in your family. You may know people who actually did this heuristic. Give one person a chance, and it doesn't work out. It's called divorce. Right? And then you, another person may, may do better. Anyway. Not to belabor the point, but th you know this happens in real life all over the place, right? You get in a traffic lane and you think it's a faster lane. All of a sudden, you see it's not. Then you abort that attempt and you switch over, and you'll be better off. That's what we can do here algorithmically, right? All right. Just can't say you didn't learn a lot about life in a class of algorithms, right? Um, now you might ask, on average. What's the size of the convex hull? Because the, the uh, runtime depends on the size of the convex hull. So you say, well, what, I what is it on average? Well, that depends on your distribution. If your distribution is inside a square, random points inside a square, x and y selected independently, randomly, in a uniform distribution, say, between 0 and 1 in a 1 by 1 square, the size of the convex hull will roughly be logarithmic in a number of points. So if you have 1,000 points inside a square, uniformly, randomly distributed, the size of a convex will be log of 1,000, which is about 10. If you have a million points, it'll be about 20. So the convex holds much smaller than the number of points, assuming it's in a square. If it's in, a, in an argon, a regular uh, four-gon or five-gon, five-gon is a pentagon, six-gon is a hexagon, that depends on the number of sides. So it's R, the number of sides in the gon, argon, um, times log n. So if it's in a hexagon, it'll be six times log n. And you can sort of see why. Because if you have a, if you have a polygon of 50 sides, regular polygon of 50 sides, and you put 1,000 points in there, or even 100 points in there, when you compute the convex hull, the convex hull will kind of take the shape of the enclosing argon, thousand gon, or square, or hexagon. Convex will be so many points that some will be cl very close to the periphery. And when you take the convex hole, it'll look like the shape of the original polygon that enclosed it. How many can sort of intuitively see that? Yeah, that, that's what will tend to happen. So the size of the convex hole will have as many edges in it as the original gon that <laughs> enclosed it, whether it's a 50 gon or a thousand gon or whatever. That's why you have this result. If it's in a circle, you can think about a circle as an infinity gun, but the number of edges in the convex hole, if they're all in a circle, will not be infinity, obviously. Uh, but that runs as the cube root of n. So it's more than if it was in a discrete polygon, because it's a circle, because it will sort of resemble the circle. And in a sphere, it's a square root of n. So it'll be more of them. And so if you run Jarvis's march in a circle, the number of um, points in a convex hole will be roughly n to the 1 third, and the running time will be big O of n to the 4 thirds, because it's n times h, and h is n to the third times another n, because that's the runtime of Jarvis. So it'll be n to the 4 thirds. So it'll be worse than n log n if, the, if all the points are uniformly distributed in a unit circle. How many understand all that? That's what it's just, just a few of you? Any questions about this? So I'm sort of now ex we're exploring these results of the size of the convex hole, given that the distribution of the points comes from these particular scenarios. 
And you can imagine other scenarios, too. And by the way, how do we know these, these, these are the numbers? That's a lot of analysis. It's a lot of probabilistic arguments and analysis. And we're not giving a proof of these. We're just stating these results, just so we know, just so you know. And these are not necessarily easy to derive, but, but that's what they are. OK. Any, any other thoughts or issues about this? OK. So let's explore a few more algorithms, just like we did for sorting. Let's explore a few more algorithms for convex hulls. So uh, this one is, uh, will mimic quick hull, will mimic quick sort, and we call it quick hull, therefore. So here's how it works. You find the left and rightmost points with the largest and smallest x coordinates. So the first point is this, the second point is that. Right? So you bound it from the left and the right by vertical lines. And these are the two vertical lines here in green. And then what you do is you connect these two dots, the leftmost and the rightmost, and you partition around this line connecting these two dots in purple. So that partitions are set around the upper half and the lower half of the original point set. Remember, this is an analog of quicksort. So just like quicksort uses a pivot element, this is the pivot here in purple. It, it partitions the rest of the points as into two subsets, one to the left and one to the right, just like we did in quicksort with numbers. Now, it's not necessarily a completely balanced partition, just like quicksort didn't necessarily guarantee a completely balanced partition of n over 2 and n over 2. It could have been 70-30 or 60-40 or even 90-10 or even worse. Same thing can happen here, but let, bear, bear with me and let's see how it works first. So then you take a parallel line going up to the uppermost y-coordinate of all the other points. Okay. Uh, in other words, you, you take the parallel line going up until it hits the, f the furthest point away from this purple line. You do the same thing below. So you create these two green lines going parallel. Then you connect them into a parallelogram, four sides. Once you connect these four points in purple, what can you tell me about all the points inside this parallelogram versus points that are outside this parallelogram in these triangular regions around the parallelogram, around the, the uh, uh, quadrilateral, I guess. It's not strictly speaking a parallelogram, but a quadrilateral, a figure with four, a polygon with four sides. <coughs> what can you tell me about all the points in the interior of this quadrilateral? Yeah. Yeah, they're going to be inside the hole and therefore not part of the convex hole boundary right? that, that we're looking for. They're not going to be laying on the, on the convex hole itself. So we can eliminate all those right away from any further consideration. So with a simple linear time partition operation, we eliminate a large portion of the population of points that we any, at any further m moment in time need to ever look at again during the execution of this algorithm. And that's a big win. Then what do you do? Then you run quick hull on what? Remember, it's like, it's like quick sort. And so it's going to be recursive. It's divide and conquer. You're going to run quick hull on these regions here in these triangular portions outside this quadrilateral. You run quick hull here. You run it separately here. You run it separately there. And you run it separately there. So you run it four times. So quick sort runs two things recursively. This one runs four things recursively. I mean, after all, quicksort is in 1D, and this is in 2D, so you expect more recursive steps, perhaps, based on the dimension. Once you find the convex hull of this, and the convex hull of that, and the convex hull of this, and the convex hull of that, you just merge. And by the way, when I say the convex hull of these points here, for example, I mean these red points here plus this purple point and this purple point. So the convex hull will roughly be this right here, and the line going like that. So the convex hull of each region will always consist of this long line between the purple points that are part of each set that we're recursing on. So these two purple points are part of this set. These two purple points are part of this set here. These two purple points are part of this set. And one of the lines of the convex hull will always be that long line here, then a bunch of other lines going around, whatever the convex hull is. And once you get these four convex hulls, how do you get the convex hull of the original point set? 
you just surgically splice them together. You splice this convex hole with this convex hole with this convex hole with this convex hole, ignoring this long line here, and you splice them using the purple dots as connectors. And then you'll have the convex hole of the original set if you merge and splice the four convex holes of these four subsets. How many understand that? Okay. That was ha more than half a class. Good. Any questions about this? This will work. How fast will it work is the next question. And by the way, here's an animation of this is actually working. So the expected time will be n log n for the, by the same similar reasoning to quicksort. Right? On average, you eliminate a large portion, maybe a constant fraction, a half, maybe three quarters of all the points, assuming they're kind of all over the place. And you converge and recurse on smaller and smaller point sets that diminish in size exponentially. So on average, you get n log n behavior. But the worst case is n squared, just like quicksort. How can it be n squared here? What would, what, what would a worst case look like? Yeah. Yes, my partner wants a circle. So if all the points are on the periphery of a circle and you do this trick, how many will be eliminated at every step? Almost none. None, none really. And you just keep recursing and recursing and recursing. And you're spending linear time to not eliminate anything. And, uh, but you're going to be recursing on smaller and smaller subsets. And eventually, you'll, the job will get done. It's not going to be incorrect. It's just going to take quadratic time, because very little gets eliminated at every step. <laughs> now you're getting it. So quadratic worst case behavior, not so good. Um, but it does generalize to higher dimensions. You can see how this will work in 3D. How many can sort of wrap your mind around what will this look like in three dimensions? Yeah, find the farthest and points on this side, on this side. Draw a big plane. Once you draw this big plane, you know, you can separate it into two subsets. And then find the other extremes, and you'd have some sort of a, instead of a quadrilateral, you'll have some sort of a cuboid, something that looks like a skewed cube in 3D. And then you look at how many times do you recurse? Eight, roughly. Not roughly, but exactly, actually. Uh, and uh, you just keep going, and this, this obviously generalizes to any dimension. And that's not a trivial statement, because some of the previous algorithms for convex hole did not generalize to higher dimensions, at least not in any obvious way. Like Graham scan did not generalize to ob in an obvious way to, to 3D or any other higher dimension, for that matter. And it does parallelize. Again, some algorithms don't parallelize very well, and we already saw you know, the Jarvis March didn't, you know, didn't parallelize very well, but this one does because you can recurse separately using separate threads in parallel on all these portions, just like quicksort parallelizes nicely, and so does merge sort. But insertion sort doesn't doesn't so much parallelize, but this one does parallelize. So that's an important property of it, even though it's worst case quadratic. All right. So just like merge sort, here comes merge hull. Uh, any questions, by the way, on any of this? Quick hull and how it's an analog of quick sort and the same kind of algorithmic principle of sub operations as quick sort, subdivide and conquer, recurse on smaller subsets, do it randomly so the split hopefully is more or less even or close to even and keep going. Okay, so merge sort works a lot like merge, uh, merge hull works like a merge sort. So how does it do it? Well, so partition the points arbitrarily into two equal subsets. Compute the convex hull of each subset separately, independently. So the original point set might be this. And I'm going to take all the blue points, put them in one set. All the red points, put them in another set, just randomly. I don't care how. Compute uh, the. Um, convex hull of the red points, that's shown in red. The convex hull of the blue points, that's shown in blue. And now you've got to merge the two convex hulls together into a larger convex hull. And if you can do that efficiently, you got yourself a merge hull algorithm that will work how fast? 
and log n by exactly the same reasoning that Mer Mertz short works in n log n time. Because that's an even split at every level. So the remaining question is, how do you merge these two resulting convex holes? That's not completely obvious. And you, and you got to do it fast. And by fast, what do we mean here? How fast do you need to merge the two together for the whole thing to still work in n log n time? How much time do you have for the, for the merge step? Better do it in linear time. You can't take too long for that. You can't take n log n for that. Otherwise, the whole thing will work in n log n times log n time, not n log n. So you can't take your time about the merge. It's got to happen quickly in linear time. So how do you merge two convex hulls very quickly? So uh, here's how you do it as a subroutine. You pick a point with the least x, and you form some angle monotone chain. So let's say here is a convex hull. I'm showing it to you kind of diagrammatically, you know, as a, as a as an ellipse, I mean, it's not an ellipse, it's a polygon, but it could have so many, could have a million lines in it, a million uh, edges and vertices in it. But there's the convex hull, and if you take a point outside the convex hull and come up with the tangent lines to the convex hull, how do you pick a point outside the convex hull? Well, just find the least x coordinate in the entire convex hull or set point set to begin with, and then subtract 10 from that, and then you get a point outside, for example. So that's easy to do. Take that point outside and form supporting lines, tangent lines, like this. Find the line that's tangent to this convex hull. In a second, we'll, we'll see how fast you can do that. And find this other line that's tangent to the convex hull on the other side. And once you find these two tangents, you know that the polar angle sorted order of all these points in this chain here all these points in this chain here go from low angle to higher angle to higher angle to higher angle all the way to the top angle of the top line. So all the angles there will go from low to high. And the outside chain, a similar phenomena will occur. But let, let's just look at this chain and it goes from low to high. Uh, the outside chain is the same thing. It goes from low and, it, and if, you, if you keep creating lines here, it'll go higher and higher and higher polar angles until it hit reaches a maximum there. So you can think about these two chains from here to here on one side, and then from here to here on the other side as two monot monotone chains. Monotone means non-decreasing or non-increasing. You know, it just keeps growing or just keeps shrinking. M monotonous, mo monotonicity. Monotone means going only up or only down. Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't do it repeatedly, like a sine wave. How many understand that notion? That you have two monotone chains of vertices by polar angle. It's monotone in the polar angle. OK. So once, once you have this increasing angle going up from here to here, and from here to here as well, you can do something with that. You can use it, you can exploit that monotonicity to do something quickly, to do the merge quickly. We'll see how that works in a second. But for now, let's, let's look at the following observation. So the convex hull of an L-gon plus an M-gon could have an L plus M total number of vertices. It could have all the original vertices in it. So for example, if I have a convex hull that looks like a, a, a square, quadrilateral, that's so it's got four points in it. And in another convex hole, it looks like a, like a pentagon, like a skewed pentagon with five points in it. The convex hole of their union could have a total of nine points in it, but no more. How many can sort of see that? Yeah, it could happen. And let me show you an example where it does happen. Here's an L-gon, you know, a, a, a polygon with L vertices and edges. And here is another polygon that's an M-gon with M vertices and edges. And the convex hull of the union of the two of them could have as many vertices and edges as the sum of the two. And there it is in green. Every single vertex of the red and every single vertex of the blue will both all be in the convex hull of the union of the two. So, but it can't be, obviously, more than that, because that's, that's all there is. But it could be as bad as that. So 
when you have these two chains, you can merge all of these points here and all of these points here. You can merge them into a single increasing polar angle order. How many understand that? Let me say it in other words. If you have a sorted list and another sorted list, you can merge the two sorted lists into a single sorted list. How many can see that? And you can do it very quickly. How fast? Linear time. Linear in the sum of the two lengths of the two lists. Right? So you basically do this. And it doesn't have to be a perfect shuffle. It could be, you know, it could be this. But that's OK. If one list is sorted, the other. That's, how, that's why merge sort works so quickly. And that's why merge whole works so quickly for the same reason. And you basically combine this list with this list into a single list that's monotone in the polar angle. OK? And you do that for both convex hulls. So for example, one easy way to get a list in monotonic order, you start with this point, and then you, you, you go around this first convex hull in red. You go, polar angle increases, 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 and then decreases, 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 decreases. And you combine these two chains into a single chain in monotonic polar order for the first convex hull, the first polygon in red. You do the same thing for the blue. Then you merge all the red and all the blue points in increasing polar order, monotone increasing polar order. And now you can do gram scan on that list and get the convex hull of the union of the two polygons in how fast? How fast of a time? Not a trick question. Remember, the gram scan here works how fast in the total number of points? Just the scan part, not the sort. Linear time. How many get that? We went over that, right? We even said it on the slide explicitly. Linear time to scan right here. So fast forward to the merge hole algorithm. Once we have the two convex holes, for each one, we take the two chains, the two chains, and merge them into a monotonic order. And then we take the two pairs of chains merged into monotonic order and merge those into yet another big monotonic order by polar angle. Now you can just do gram scan on all these points. And in linear time, derive the convex hull of both of them together. How many get that? There's only a few people raising their hand. So ask me questions. I, I'll be happy to explain it a few more times. Yeah. Well, OK, so example would be like this here. So at this point, you can go into this convex hull and say, that's the first point, that's the second point, that's the third point. And then the angle starts decreasing with respect to this anchor here. right? So, so right now we've been through this chain here on this side. So this, these three points here, one, two, three, are this chain here in red. The, the other two points, or you know, with this one and this one, will be this chain here. So you take the two chains and you merge them by polar angle. So once you do that, you do, you do that also for the other polygon, which is the other convex hull. You merge the two chains left and right by polar angle. And then you merge the two lists, the two combined lists, into polar angle. And now you have the entire point set made up of all of these red and blue uh, convex hull points sorted in polar angle. And if you have a point set sorted in polar angle, gram scan can make a convex hull around it very nicely in linear time, like, like we saw two slides ago. And that's what you do next. Then it'll give you the convex hull of the union of two, 
original convex holes. Why was it important to create this sorted list bipolar angle in linear time and not just use mer you know, uh, uh, merge sort or, or heap sort to sort them in n log n time, which will be even easier because then you wouldn't have to worry about these chains and monotones and merging of things. And why don't we just use merge sort to sort all the points in polar angle and then do gram scan around it? Let me ask you a, a leading question. Would it be incorrect to do that? Will it give you a wrong answer if you did that? I mean, you say, no, it'll still be right. Yeah, it'll still be right. It'll just be slower. Because you'll take n, n log n time just to do the merge step. But remember, remember, this is a recursive algorithm. Merge hole. It keeps dividing the points into subsets and subsets, and just like merge short. So let's go back to merge short. In merge sort, what did you do? Divide the points into two equal size subsets, sort each one separately, and then combine them in linear time. How? By zipping together the two, the two m m sorted lists into a single sorted list by a linear scan along the two lists simultaneously. How many remember that? How, that's how merge sort works. Good. How fast was this merge step? to merge a sorted list and another sorted list into a combined sorted list. Linear time. What if we took n log n time to do this merge step? Will it be incorrect? Will it give us an incorrect result if we took n log n time to do it? I'm going to say, no, it'll still be correct. Yeah, it doesn't matter how long it takes you to merge the two lists into a sorted single list. But the longer you take, the longer the overall algorithm will take. And if you do it n log n time just to do the merge, Remember, you're doing it recursively over and over and over again. It'll add up throughout the recursion steps, and the total time wouldn't be n log n. It'll be n log squared n, n log n times log n. Because you took too long to do the merge. So the whole point is do doing the merge efficiently when you do divide and conquer. Divide and conquer, what's the general template? To solve a problem, you solve two sub-problems, and then combine their solutions into the solution of the original problem. That's what divide and conquer means. <coughs> but if you took too long to do this combination of the two sub-solutions into a larger solution for the original problem, the whole thing will run much slower if you took too long for, uh, for the merge step. Because you know, it compounds on you. You're not just doing it once, this mer merge step. You're doing it many times throughout the recursion, up and down the recursion. So you have to do it efficiently. So here, we have to combine the two convex hole solutions into a single convex also efficiently, and that means linear time. Okay, So then, if you do it in linear time, you get overall n log n time complexity. And because the recurrence relation looks like this, right? The time to do n things is twice the time to do n over two things, plus this linear term. That's important. Right? The merge step, I'm color coding it in green here, is this term here in the recursion. And together, you give you n log n time. And this generalizes to higher dimensions, obviously. And uh, it does parallelize, because you, you're solving the subproblems separately, independently. So you could parallelize them on different threads or different processors or different computers altogether. Um, so any questions about this? This is the analog for convex holes of merge sorting numbers. At least conceptually, abstractly, it's the same template and the same time complexity, and for the same reasons, because it's a divide and conquer approach. Yeah? Uh, so why does it generalize to higher dimensions? Because gram scan is <coughs> so how do you sort the points? Uh, yeah, so when I say run gram scan, I kind of hard coded it to 2D. That's a very good point. What I really should have said is, OK, uh, you have a point there. Does it actually generalize? Yeah, so he's questioning whether it actually generalizes. Uh, because gram scan, as it stands, as the way we describe it, doesn't, ge ge doesn't generalize. Uh, all right, that's something I'll have to think about. Uh, 
But if you think about it before I do, uh, or even if you think about it after I do, extra credit, because that's a very valid point. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but if once we go to 3D, uh, it's not clear how Gram scan generalizes to 3D. Oh, the 2D. Yeah, okay. Well, what about the 2D again? I, I um, well, if you count if you count the heavy parallelism. Um, you could, uh, you you could, the, the the overall clock time will be will be linear or less, maybe even even less. Uh, I'm not sure if you can get a lot below linear, but uh, but if you write in a parallel fashion and you do all the right optimizations, you, you, you won't you won't take n log n time clock time. The total amount of work will still be n log n, but uh, but if you do things in parallel by uh, by deploying multiple processors. You know, yeah, the time will be faster. Uh, it could be linear. Uh, it, it, uh, the real question will be, could it be less than linear? And it could probably do it in less than linear if, you, if you're very clever about the parallelization. Uh, you, you may have to slightly modify the algorithm to get it below linear total parallel time. But OK. Um, let's talk about the lower bound for convex hull. So far, we came up with a bunch of algorithms that run in n log n time for convex hull. Right? Merge hull and gram scan and some meta heuristics, they all run in n log n worst case. But what's the best case? You know, we haven't said so far that it takes as much as n log n time in the worst case in general. Maybe there's an algorithm that runs in n log log n time or even linear time that is, works in general. We haven't shown that that's not true. We're about to show that that's not true. That the lower bound for convex hull is n log n, omega n log n necessarily. Just like we argue that sorting takes n log n, worst case, time complexity. All right, and that was based on the decision tree model and you know, the number of permutations that exist. And the log of that was n log n. The number of permutations was n factorial. Here, the proof is maybe even simpler than that. Simpler than that of sorting. Because we're going to reduce sorting to convex hull. We can show here on this slide, we will show that if you can compute convex hulls in general, you can sort in general. From the convex hull computation, you can extract a sorted order or an arbitrary point set. And if, and if once we show that, that establishes that convex hulls are at least as hard as sorting, because sorting is implicit in the convex hull computation. How are we going to do this tall order like this? Let's say you want to sort a bunch of numbers. So this is an instance of sorting. A bunch of random numbers on a number line, arbitrary numbers. No assumption about what these numbers are. They're just arbitrary, n numbers on the number line. What we're going to do is raise them all to a parabola. So we're going to go to second dimension. Because sorting is a one-dimensional instance. See? Sorting inherently is one-dimensional. How many understand that abstraction? Sorting is one-dimensional. It's just points on the x-axis, just numbers. Right? Convex holes is essentially a two-dimensional problem, or higher dimension. But it, you know, the one-dimensional version of convex hull is trivial. So we're going to take these numbers that we're trying to sort. We're going to square them all. When you square things, you're creating a parabola. Right. So once you square all these numbers, they'll end up on this parabola here very nicely. The parabola is y is equal to x squared. Right. So by squaring them, creating the pairs x sub i, to, the numbers x sub i to be sorted, create the ordered pairs x sub i comma x sub i squared. So how many see that squaring these blue dots will raise them to the green parabola? Uh, that's what happens. Right. Parabola has the equation y is equal to x squared. 
once you raise them to the parabola, take your convex hole subroutine, however fast that runs. Let's say, let's say somebody magically provided to you a convex hole subroutine that runs in linear time. Never mind how, it's a black box guaranteed to run in linear time. Always correctly compute the convex hole. Take that black box subroutine, apply it to these green points on the parabola. What's the convex hole of these green points? What will the convex hole look like? All the green dots will be connected, and finally the two end dots will be connected to each other. So the convex hole will just connect all these dots using line segments. And finally, the last dot will be connected to the first dot. So in red here, we see what the convex hole of these green dots is going to be, the red segments. How many can see that? It's pretty unique. It has no choice but to be that. Why? Because it's not going to crisscross itself. The convex hole will be that, necessarily. And this black, hole, black box subroutine that you were magically provided that computes the convex hole of the green dots will return to you this red polygon. And remember, a polygon has to be given in order, in order of the points around the periphery. So this black box subroutine that computes convex hole will give you this red polygon. And from the red polygon, you can march around the polygon in order, because you're given it in order. And from that polygon, you can infer and produce the sorted sequence of the original green dots, which is really the same order as the, as the blue dots, for free. For free, we mean in linear time. From the, red from the red sequence of edges, you can produce the ordered sequence of blue dots, which is what you wanted to do to begin with if you were to sort the, the, the blue dots. In other words, if I provide to you the red polygon for free, I just enabled you to sort for free. And by for free, I mean in linear time, for cheap. How many can see that? that, that th th this argument is subtle. It's not long. It's just one slide and you know, three minutes of explanation. But it is subtle. So I'm going to repeat it. It's a lower bound argument. So it applies to which convex hole algorithm? All of them any of them, any one of them now or in the future or ever by us or by some omniscient or omnipotent species that we don't even know exists, it applies to their, their algorithms too. In other words, no algorithm in the universe could ever find a convex hole faster than n log n time, faster than sorting. Why? Because if you're trying to sort something, if you're trying to sort these numbers here, you can exploit a convex hole subroutine into sorting for you for free. By for free, I mean in linear time. So if you take an arbitrary black box subroutine for convex hull, we're going <coughs> to trick it into sorting for us. How? By squaring all these points to be sorted. And by the way, if you have a bunch of points you need to sort, squaring them preserves their order in the sorted list. How many understand that? Squaring quantities preserves their relative ordering. If something is less than something else, their squares will have the same relationship. The square of the smaller one will be less than the square of the larger one. That's important. Squaring doesn't change, doesn't flip the order around like some other operations might. Reciprocals do change the order, but not squaring. Okay, so square all the points. Create the green set from it. Once you square all the points, feed them to this convex hole subroutine, this magic convex hole subroutine that supposedly runs faster than n log n. And when it returns to you the convex hole of these points, which look like this, you can follow the in order around the periphery the green dots, and they'll tell you what the order of the blue dots were in a sorted order if they were sorted. We didn't sort them. We just fed their squares into a convex hole subroutine that gave us the convex hole. And from the convex hole, for free, we found out what the sorted order is. And so if that subroutine works in linear time, we just sort it in linear time. How many can see that? J again, just a few hands are, are raised. I know it's subtle. So let's go over it a third and a fourth time until we nail it down, because this is an important argument. 
this argument will be repeated in other guises for many other problems for the rest of the semester. So better wrap your mind around it tightly now rather than later. It's a proof by contradiction. We're proving we're not a millionaire. That's hard to do. So when we do it, especially on one slide, that's a good day in algorithms when you can prove a lower bound in a single slide. It's, uh, it's, it rarely happens. But he, here it does. So again, what's the argument? We're reducing the problem of sorting to the problem of a convex hull. It's a reduction. It's a transformation of one problem to another problem. We'll see many other transformations later in the course, especially when we talk about entropy completeness. So how do we reduce sorting to convex hull? Take an arbitrary set of numbers to sort. These are the x's, x sub i's. We, we, we're not going to sort them, but we want to sort them. We're not gonna, we don't want to spend n log n time, but if we had a convex hull subroutine that sorts in linear time, that, that creates a convex hull in linear time, we're going to use it, exploit it, take advantage of it to sort for us in linear time as well, which we know can't happen. And therefore, that subroutine for convex hull can't work in linear time either. In fact, it can't work in any time smaller than n log n, because if it did, we would be sorting in that same time. But we know this, the time for sorting is at least n log n, so a convex hull subroutine must require n log n time to do its su convex hull computation, no matter what, no matter how clever it is. No matter how omniscient the being that designed it, it still must take n log n time. It cannot be creating convex holes any faster than that. Why? Because if it did, we take an arbitrary sorting instance, raise it to the parabola, feed it to the convex hull subroutine, and from the red polygon that the convex hull subroutine returns to us, we are going to infer the, the sorted order trivially in linear time. And so the net effect is that we sort it in linear time with a single call to the convex hull subroutine. How many get that? OK, that's more hands. That's good. I'm glad I repeated it. And if you can sort in linear time with a single call to a convex hull subroutine, that's a contradiction. If the claim was that that convex hull subroutine works in less than linear time, or, or it works in less than n log n, or in particular in linear time, we know that's a contradiction because we can't sort in less than linear time. But with a single call to the convex hull subroutine, we sorted it in less than linear time, the n log n time, in particular in linear time. And that can't happen. So the convex hull subroutine, however long it takes to run, cannot run any faster than a sort algorithm. Because with a single call to a convex hull subroutine, we implemented a sort algorithm. With a single call to the convex hull subroutine. How? By taking the numbers to be sorted, not sorting them, instead raise them to the parabola, fit it to the convex hull subroutine, get the answer back, and from the answer, walk around the polygon and pick up the sorted order. And then you'll know the sorted order of the blue points, the original input, and then we sort it in linear time, if that thing ran in linear time. If it ran in any less than time than n log n, we would have sorted within that time because the extra work we did other than calling that subroutine was linear amount of work. How many see that? We did a linear amount of work outside that subroutine call. Yeah. Is that clear? What, what was that linear amount of work? Just squaring all the numbers, feeding into that subroutine, taking the answer back, walking around the, the, the red polygon that's a convex hole, and just reporting the sorted order of the points. Let, let me say one subtlety here. When you get back this red convex hole, you're not necessarily getting it this point first, lowest point first. You might get this point first, but then this second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seven, eight, nine, and ten. How many understand that? So what do you do in linear how can in linear time can you still infer the sorted order if it doesn't return to you the least x first? Remember, it has to give it to you around in order of their occurrence around the polygon. Because if you don't give the polygon vertices in order, it's not even a unique polygon. We already gave examples last time where you can connect the dots lots and lots of different ways using a simple polygon. The, the answer is not unique. How many understand that? Remember that from last time. So it, convex hole subroutine must return the convex hole in order around the periphery of the convex hole, not just an arbitrary number of points. Right? But anyway, 
what if it doesn't give you the least x point first, but rather the one of the middle points first, and then the rest in convex order, in, 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 in increasing order, it goes higher, 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 and then low, and then higher, higher, higher again, until it closes on itself. How do you infer the shorted order then? Not hard. Yeah, create two arrays. One will be monotonically increasing, and the other will go back to the beginning, monotonically increasing again, and just concatenate them in the, the, the obvious fashion. And then you get the sorted order again. Or you can take the convex hole in red, figure out what the point is on the convex hole that has the least x, start at that point, and then keep going up all the way out to the end to the highest x coordinate. And then you'll have a sorted order yet again. OK, so what have we done? We've reduced the problem of sorting to the problem of finding the convex hole. And we did this reduction in linear time with a single call to the convex hole subroutine, whatever that was. We're not even saying how the convex hole subroutine works. It's a black box designed by an omniscient entity. Very, very clever. But what we're showing here is it can't be done, however clever it is. And we don't even know what's inside this subroutine. We just showed that it cannot work faster than the speed of a sorting algorithm. Because with a single call to that subroutine, we manage to sort arbitrary sets of numbers. How many understand the logic here? That's still about a third to a half of the class. You want to ask me some questions about it? So I've repeated it about five times. That's OK. I, I'm willing to repeat it five more times, I guess, next, next, next class, until it sinks in. Because it's a subtle argument. It's not a, it's not a long argument. But it's a subtle argument. Ask me some questions. Yeah. Um, so one possible way to define convex hull is that it returns a unique polygon. Uh, another way is to just return a set of points. Together. Yes. And that's a great observation. He says to return a convex hull, you don't necessarily have to give it in order. You can just report which points are in or out of the convex hull. So is it possible to do that second one in sub n order? No, it isn't. But that's a much harder proof than it is. Yeah. So he's asking a very subtle question. He says, what if you just had to report which points are inside or outside the convex hole for a given point set? Just label me the ones that are inside, not necessarily in any order. Because from those, you can sort of infer the order if you, you know, connect them in some increasing polar angle size. That's true. It turns out that even if you had to report which points are in a convex hole, not just give it to them in order, the, 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 the n log n lower bound still holds for, the, for, for that scenario, but it's not this proof. It's a much, much harder proof than this. And you should probably at this point be glad we're not even presenting that proof here because it's a lot more complicated. And, and I'll, I can do one better even. Let's say you ask the simple binary question. I give you a bunch of points, you s and I ask you, are all the points that I gave you on the convex hull of this point set of all these points? Or some of them are not? Are any points in this point excluded from the convex hole at all? So now it's a binary question, yes and no. I'm not even asking you which points are on the convex hole. I'm just asking you, is the, is, are all the points that I'm giving you on their own convex hole? Yes or no? That's still n log n, even for this binary query. And now the answer is just a single bit, yes or no. How many understand that? That's even harder to prove than the first two. But that's also true. So co this convex hull has a very non-trivial lower bound complexity to it of n log n, no matter how you ask it, with what variations. And even if you just ask the question, are all the points I'm giving you on, the, on their own convex hull, that's still n log n. It's just harder to prove. But there's something hard about that problem. And by hard, I mean nonlinear, nonlinear time. And, and it's, it's kind of analogous to sorting. Sorting is actually easy. If I, if I ask you the yes-no question about sorting, what will that question be? I give you a bunch of points, and what's the yes-no Boolean predicate? Is this list sorted or not? That's sort of the analog of what we just talked about for convex hull. That, an that question can be answered in linear time for sorting. Go up the list, make sure it's monotonic, and then you'll know if it's sorted or not. In linear time, you'll know. But for convex hull? Linear time won't even suffice to tell you if all the points are in the convex hole or some of them are missing from the convex hole. So there's something about convex hole even a little harder than sorting in the, in the sense of this Boolean predicate.
bottom line is convex hull takes at least n log n comparisons no matter what. It's a proof by contradiction. It's also a linear time transformation of sorting to convex hulls. We'll see lots of other transformations, and uh, it'll be fun. Any other questions about this? So the first thing we're going to do next time is go over this proof again much quicker, but this, this should sink in. And uh, let me show you where, uh, so in the book, in the Corman book, uh, it's chapter 33, uh, computational geometry. So look at this chapter. Uh, you'll see some of these insights about convex hull algorithms and so on. And in the other book, um, uh, Computational Geometry by Perperata and Shamis, and Michael Ian Shamis actually invented computational geometry back in the 1970s using his PhD thesis as a jumping start to this whole field. It's chapter three and also chapter four. Uh, you don't have to read these entire chapters, but you know, it talks about Graham Scan and Jarvis March and the, you know, the time complexity. Very, very nicely, very nice presentation. So how many have actually looked at this book already? Uh, a few people, okay. If you looked at it, I'm impressed. Uh, if you didn't look at it yet, I'm not sure what you're waiting for, but uh, please do. Uh, again, you don't have to read these chapters cover to cover, but just to reinforce everything we talked about in class and relevant problems from the homework and or the problem sets and that kind of thing. Okay, any last minute questions or comments? All right, we'll see you next time. Some of them are not positive. What you can do is you can add some large positive number to all of them and make them all positive. So without loss of generality, you can assume they're all positive. Or, or just add a billion to all of them, and then they'll become all positive. Because adding a single constant to all of them doesn't change the order. It just preserves the order. All right. Thanks. So I have two questions. First, uh, I wanted to verify that uh, the intuition behind the, what you just explained, the proof by right, contradiction, isn't it kind of like a polygon and applies like Ordered and monotone, like yeah. Of yeah, that's implicit because the convex hull has to be reported as a polygon to you, and then the monotonicity of the points around the polygon allows you to infer the, con the sorted order of the original arbitrary point set or uh, set of numbers. So, yeah, uh, that's right. And the second about uh, merge hull, uh, it seems to me it's kind of uh, piggybacking on like the uh, Jarvis march because. Like um, after you merge the the two chains, like you still get a like you, you still get a sort of list of points by polar angle, and then we do the diff wrap. Uh, we could, or you can just m surgically splice them without even doing Jarvis, because this this will be the the, the convex hole here. This will be all you got to do is connect them right there, and you're guaranteed to have the convex hole around the periphery. So you don't even have to re-wrap them or re-gift wrap them or anything like that. You could, but, oh. you, but you don't have to. You just splice them oh. and splice them, and that's it. I don't understand the splice. Yeah. So the splice is real simple. Right. So uh, I have one question to ask you. Uh, are we still looking at November with terms of midterm or early November is what you said once? Uh, yeah, it's either uh, early November or, uh, or maybe late October. We should nail down a we'll nail, nail down a, a date real soon so sure. that's why it's but it's clear. not going to be mid october right it's going no. either going to be late october or early november yeah so it's still a few weeks away yeah. so thank you so much sure. for that. Yeah. thank you